Hello, welcome to the Big Scuba Show. Hi, I'm Sarah Donoghue, and I'm big on marine conservation and, of course, the problems with plastics in our ocean. I'm also a marine stunt woman, and I'm here with Gemma and Ian on the Big Scuba podcast to talk about everything on and under the sea, as well as my take on diver safety when it comes to international dive trips. Hello and welcome to the Big Scuba Podcast. My name is Ian and I am in the car with... <laughs> Hello, my name is Gemma. Welcome to the Big Scuba Podcast. Yeah, so uh, thanks for downloading this uh, episode. We are sponsored by Night at 90 and did you know they are beyond technical? Yes, so and if you'd like to help them out at the moment, give them a follow on their Facebook page. Yeah, yeah. make sure you're following the right page because they got hacked recently, um, and yeah, which is awful. And uh, I can't imagine what you know the hassle that must cause when <laughs> something like that happened. So make sure you're following them on the right Facebook page. Yes, and the link will be in the show notes. Um, so, have, look them up. Coming up, we speak to Sarah O'Donoghue. Uh, O'Donoghue. Sarah Donahue, even. Why did I get Can't the name people? Yeah. Sarah Donahue, even. And uh, we connected with Sarah at the Go Dive show, and uh, where she was a speaker. And she, a lot of people might also know her from uh, presenting and commentating on powerboat racing. Yes. Well. Yeah. Um, yeah. She's very passionate about ocean conservation as well, isn't she? And yeah. uh, we cover that in the the podcast as well, and safety as well, diving. Yeah. So, so uh, big on the old safety and stuff like that. Yeah. What have you been up to then? Well, first of all, why are we sitting in the car? We. Uh, yeah. Are, why are we sitting in the car? <laughs> We're on location. We have had a morning paddleboarding. We have. Yeah. Been on. Been out on the sea line boards. Uh, done a lap of the lake uh, here in sunny Norfolk. And um, we've got uh, the Honey Meister with us as well. And um, we've had a quite a nice morning. Yeah, it was quite windy on the water, but um, yeah, we sea lion boards stood up to it. Well. Yeah, we were going to do a recording um, actually outside while we we're making this lovely cup of tea. <laughs> Um, Thank but you. <laughs> uh, we've timed it when the, all the sea cadets are here as well, so it's quite loud. Yeah, really. but they're having a great time. They are having just a about, fun time. Yeah, to go out in their sailing boats. So that's, yeah, we'll see um, how they get on in the wind. Yes, what can go wrong? <laughs> so sea lion paddle boards. Um, the link is in the show notes, and you can get a decent discount with those. Uh, we've been using sea lion paddle boards for oh, a couple, 18 a year, months. Yeah, eighteen months, I guess. Yeah, yeah so they're, they're striking looking boards. Very handsome to look at, I'd say. On the they water. Are. Yeah, they do look good. I quite like the the wood pine effect on the board. I think uh, I've not seen that on any other ones. No, no, not at all. So, yeah, look up sea lion uh, boards. Yeah. So, um, what else have we been up to? Working on our fitness as well. You've been usual, yeah, crossfitting and um, just work and things like that. Really, it's sort of a bit hectic at the moment. Um, I'm hoping that'll calm down and we can organise a dive for it. It'd be nice. Um, looking at the sea, because usually about now we kind of start thinking about Weybourne, um, but it's a bit murky at the minute mm. off, our, off our coast. Yeah. Very brown, stirred up from all the rain. It has been raining quite a bit, hasn't it? And high winds, yeah. I did a big hike yesterday on the beach and yeah the water was very brown very brown so yeah unfortunately so hopefully we'll be at Weybourne or somewhere off our coast uh, this year um, we have got the farms coming up and uh, all being well I uh, should hopefully be at Stony to, or maybe go to Cape Moray or Bobsill or, or somewhere yeah, be nice. um, Spring Lakes we got recommended another dive site didn't we up oh, that's in true. Nottingham yes yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, one to try, maybe a new one. Yeah, yeah, that'd be good. Um, what else? What we else have you did been doing? Um, just to say thank you for all the people that supported our D-Day post. Um, we yeah, that's, put that's done really well. Incredible response. Um, lots of response. Oh, our post do well, well, of course. <laughs> well, this one in particular did extremely well. Yeah. Thank you for sharing it and um, all the comments people made. So if you want to have a look at the post and people were recommending books to read. Yeah. Um, uh, in, more information about the divers or the people that did the underwater clearance um, on the actual day. That was really interesting, wasn't Over it? Over 100-odd shares as well, weren't there? 
233, wow. I think, as of today. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. So um, we want to say uh, thanks for everyone who shared. And, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a subject that's close to everyone's heart. And we have a lot to be thankful um, of everyone who served. So, uh, yeah, it's, um, you know, it's good to... Yeah, it was a, an interesting. I hope you got a chance to to have a to to watch some of it. It all started Wednesday night, didn't it? Mm. Bayer. Yeah. Uh, with a, so that's good. And diving did play a part. You know, there was divers. Jack Cousteau. You know, he he come up through French resistance and what mm -hmm. have you. So. Uh, yeah, yeah. So history. We should remember our history. Um, Ford. We shared something in the week of Ford uh, because they've been involved in a big cycle. Well, it's not just cycle, but walking, everything. Yeah, and it's from in stages. Ben, starts at ben, started on the 6th of June at Ben Nevis, and then they w walk th through or cycle or however you want to do it to Ben Big Ben in London, mm. West, uh, Westminster, which is pretty cool. It's called... Cool. The website is called Running Out of Time. Running Out of yeah. Time. Yeah, if you go, if you Google Running Out of Time or um, go to our posts, there's links on our previous posts this week, um, and that will take you there. It's too late now because it's started. Um, it's been going a few days now. Um, but there's a lot of people up and down the country get involved in it, and it is uh, bringing attention to climate change. Um, if you look up... I think there's a hashtag of climate relay as well. Mm. Um, you'll find it. But again, we'll we'll put a link in the show notes so you can still have a look and look at the website. And next year, get involved. And yeah. I think they do a different. They'll probably do a different route. It didn't come to East Anglia. No, I think the nearest it got to was Milton Keynes in Milton Keynes, Bedford, yeah. That yeah. country. Yeah. But we'll say thanks to Oliver for uh, sharing that with us, so we could uh, share that with you. Yeah. So have a look at their link and uh, yeah, and also have a look at Ford's sustainability page as well because that's really interesting, isn't it, about what they do? Yeah, yeah, and they are sharing about it more now. And uh, hopefully, uh, if you're looking around for um, one, maybe a new electric car, that might play a part. I don't mm. know. Yeah. So I think that's probably we've got a busy week ahead, and uh, we'll keep doing what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. If you've, um, we've, um, if you're looking for if you want to come on and uh, talk about your diving career, uh, that'd be really good to hear from you. And uh, yeah, that'd be that'd be cool. Yeah. So we always like to hear from our guests and our listeners. Drop us an email or contact us on social media. Um, drop us a DM and uh, make sure you're following us on our social media. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So all the links are in the show notes. But I think we better get over to our guest and um... drink the finish our cup of tea. <laughs> yes. Cheers. So this is episode 100. To Sarah Donahue. So, welcome to the Big Scoop podcast. We are with us. We've got Sarah Donahue, and uh, we want to say thank you for joining us on the Big Scuba. Uh, so, we're going to get straight into it and say, hey, uh, what does diving and being underwater mean to you? Um, it means everything to me because I've got such a big connection with the ocean because I race offshore power boats. And of course, I had a really big crash uh, many, many years ago, a couple of decades ago, where I was on a life support machine. Um, and I think after that, uh, my experience of being underwater, of course, was without air. <laughs> um, so then, of course, when I went into diving, I then kind of really did submerge myself into it and learn as much as I could about it. And I just love everything about being on the ocean and in the ocean. Um, and of course, everything to do with marine conservation as well and the, the problem we're having with plastics. Mm. Yeah. So who um, who gets the credit for first getting you into water and uh, trying to breathe underwater? Well, funnily enough, uh, when it comes to that, it was because I had had a powerboat accident and I was on a life support machine and I drowned. Um, well, that was just one of the things that happened to me, but I drowned. <laughs> so then when I reconstructed my own accident, my uh, safety diver, if that's what you call him, my safety diver, who I worked with in an underwater film studio, was a guy called Bob. Right. Um, and it was just really, it was my first time of ever actually breathing air underwater as opposed to 
breathing in water. And I think it was that experience um, just kind of, it just really opened my eyes a lot. And I, it was after that, I just thought, I, I really want to to learn to do this. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And for some people, that would sound quite scary, having a terrible accident, drowning and then thinking, oh, I want to go back onto water. (laughs) Yeah. And I think it especially was because when I was then hung upside down in a cockpit of a powerboat in water, remember, I couldn't I wasn't then um, given air all the time because they had to film it. So it was a case of I had Bob on standby who was then feeding me air whenever I looked like I needed it. And then it was a case of being upside down without air underwater. Um, You know, sometimes for, I don't know, 45 minutes at a time and every now and again, he'd just, you know, pass air to me and I'd breathe it and then it'd be taken away from me. So it was a really uh, bizarre experience, but I learned a lot. I learned a real lot from that experience. Mm, yeah just incredible so from actually learning to scuba dive how did you go through the certifications do your open water yeah I I did I um the the first thing I did was contact a friend of mine my best friend Talisa who I've known most of my life and I said to her I said you fancy learning to scuba dive with me you know rather than me do it on my own yeah so I said do you want to learn to scuba dive she said oh yeah I'd love to I'm up for that So we decided to book a dive trip. So instead of doing it in the UK, we flew out to the Red Sea um, and we did a liverboard for just over two weeks. It was about two and a half weeks. We did a liverboard over there. And it was funny, actually, because we ended up doing all in one sitting, open water, advanced and then rescue. Oh, wow. Um, (laughs) Yeah. All in in one sitting. Now, I would say to anyone, um, I did that. But I, I wouldn't say to everyone to do that no. because I think you learn through experience and doing things over and over and over again. Doing things repetitively means that it sinks in yeah. and you know what you're doing. So and remember, you've got to remember that when I did this, I didn't know about scuba diving. I didn't have any friends that did scuba diving. Um, apart from the rescue divers we have on, on the race courses, Um so I didn't re I didn't know then what I know now. Mm. So if I knew that then, I wouldn't now race and do them all together. Yeah. I would do the open water. I would embrace the open water. I would then do the advanced, and I would embrace that. And then I would really research the rescue diving because of all the elements to that. And then I would do that. Whereas me, I just crammed them all in. Um, and then after that, you forget so much, and then you have to. Uh, it's all repetitive diving, isn't it? To then, yeah, for it to then sink in. So yeah, I kind of I did them all together. Oh, wow. Well, since then, of course, I've done many dives. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I I really did. But I I'm that sort of person that I like to once I get involved, I like to do everything immediately. Uh, yeah. But I would definitely say to anyone else, don't do that. Go through it methodically, understand it, enjoy it, experience it, and then do the next qualification. Mm. Yeah, that's good advice. There's a lot of people uh, I know um, through uh, working with our local dive centre um, has gone course, 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 and then not done any pleasure dive and as such till later on. And uh, I think you're right. It's good to break it up and uh, do mm. get some pleasure dives in, in in between as well. Well, so, yeah, and and also when when I was with Talisa, um uh she did she we obviously did the same things yeah but i didn't think her you know the, the the way she was in water how it should have been to have then passed um the rescue diving and yeah. she'll kill me for saying that she doesn't have to she'll kill me for saying that but <laughs> um i don't think her buoyancy was good enough and yeah. i had my concerns about that because of both we both crammed it in yeah. and whereas i am a water baby and i'm very used to to water um tea isn't the same of course you can dive now and it's fine but at the start that mm-hmm. that's what i'm saying that that's why when i watch talisa i look back now and i think really i would advise people not to do that um because to get your buoyancy you can't always get it that quickly can you especially yeah. when you've got so many other skills to learn yeah. especially when you go into rescue diving you've got yeah. tons of other stuff you need to learn well that is the paddy way but if you look at some of the other agencies first things that they teach is buoyancy don't do any other skills it's all buoyancy 
and you don't do anything else till you got your buoyancy. Mm-hmm. And yeah, uh, there's exactly. a lot to be said for that. Yeah. Yeah. Today's episode is sponsored by Narked at 90. So let's find out a bit more about them. Narked at 90, their tagline has been beyond technical, which describes them pretty well. John Routley and Brent Hudson launched the company over 20 years ago. They are both technical divers who have logged thousands of mixed gas dives between them over a 30 year period. Using their engineering know-how and diving expertise have developed bespoke personal, commercial and military diving equipment and products of a universally recognised unparalleled calibre. Their ability to be adaptive and versatile with their developments led them to support the NHS during COVID. Using their superior knowledge of breathing and oxygen monitoring systems to help develop emergency ventilators. They also design and supply the sneaky stuff used by defence-based development groups throughout the Western world, although they can't tell us much about that. If you're thinking of moving across to tech diving or completely new to diving, Narked at 90 can advise and guide on the best equipment and setup for your personal or commercial requirements. Narked at 90 have unparalleled experience of shearwater dive computers, and are the longest serving and sole and UK European service centre for those. They are happy to offer technical support, servicing, repairs and upgrades to all Shearwater computers, past and present. Narked at 90 stock Shearwater computers, but are also stockers and technical support centre for many other manufacturers, including Divesoft, JJCCR, Hollis, Revo and Kiss Rebreathers. Based centrally in the UK, Narked at 90 also offer full rebreather head servicing for selected manufacturers. Bespoke cable assemblies. Advice on specific fitting requirements. Suggestions and guidance for home builds. Computer laser cutting and engraving. Pressure testing to simulate 400 metre dives. So, Narked at 90, a reputation built on supporting both manufacturers and divers worldwide. Go to narkedat90.com and make sure you are following their social media to keep up to date with their latest news and offers. So, from there, have you managed to dive around the world and in the UK? Do you know what? I've dived all over the place, but I only started diving, you won't believe this, my first dive in the UK in those cold, cold waters uh, was actually with Andark when I went to do my um, dive dive media course, uh, you know, the commercial diving course, yeah. H- HSE course. So that was my first time um, over there. So I'd done wow. diving everywhere, but always in a wetsuit. Uh, <laughs> and I'd been, uh, I'd spoke to Otter and I'm one of Otter's uh, ambassadors because yeah. I knew Otter were just like the best. And because I'd worked on film sets and everything, I know that um, Otto worked with Pinewood Studios with Dave Shaw at Pinewood Studios and I worked with Dave Shaw yeah. so my obvious choice was to uh, work with Otto so um, so yeah so my first time diving in the UK was uh, was yeah it wasn't long ago it was it's so cold yeah <laughs> it is that's the UK and we should say at this point other dry suits are available and um, yes of course they are there's lots of other dry suits available lots of others <laughs> <laughs> but they helped me really keep warm. It was just, uh, yeah, so, yeah, I have dived in a lot of places, but my first time in the UK wasn't long ago. At but all. you can do it in a wetsuit as well, though. Oh, I wouldn't want to do that. In the summer, yeah, fine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm so used to wetsuit diving. Um, but I think once you start diving abroad all the time, especially like I've dived abroad, uh, you get cold really quickly, especially mm. when you live in Spain as well. Yeah. Um, you just you just get so accustomed to the heat that no matter what happens, even when I go back to the UK in summer, I'm freezing cold because I'm so yeah. used to it being like, I don't know, 30 degrees out here. I think that's true. Yeah, you do get used nice. to your environment, definitely. Yes, for sure. Surface yeah. interval, what does that look like at the moment? How, when did you last dive in? Uh, oh, well, you mean dry suit or wet suit? Either, either. Being <laughs> underwater, when did you last dive? Well, do you know what? Funnily enough, I haven't managed to this year 
um, just because I've been so busy because we've had so many other projects on it. I've had so many projects on because I work with uh, offshore powerboat racings and yeah. I've been working on my UIM commission as well. So I wanted to be a UIM commissioner, which is um, that's for powerboat racing, the higher governing body, which is okay. international. So I've been working on that, but I'm hoping to dive in Spain in the next two or three weeks. So I'm looking yeah. forward to that. I've, I've just been desperate to get underwater, but um, time hasn't allowed me because I've been flying so much. So yeah. I've just been too busy. Yeah, well, that's life, isn't it? It's, you know, it's, things have to come first. <laughs> do, <laughs> that's just it. Yeah. Yeah. So also you are a marine stunt person as well. So does that, yes. that involve diving or just kind of underwater scenes like you said being fed air well the thing is it's um everything's everything's very different now so a lot of my marine stunt work is on top of the water boat uh, boat driving because i'm an offshore racer so if they need an expert to handle a boat then they call me which is nice <laughs> um um but if you work in the water and you know you have breathing apparatus uh, then you have to be HSE qualified. So it's yeah. mandatory now. So, you know, regardless, you have to be doing your HSE certification um, to work in the stunt industry if you want to um, continue doing any work in mm. the water. And I think it's right that it's regulated. Yeah. I mean, there's only, I think there's only really the UK that do that. We're really strict, but we are strict on everything. So um, I think it's a good thing that the UK have this... Um, Think about safety because I do think we're safer than any other nationality. I really do. And boy, have I seen some bad things when I've been abroad. So yeah, thank you, UK, for being so strict on safety <laughs> regulations. It's true, isn't it? Uh, yeah. So you've done your HSC commercial diving ticket. Yes, I did that with Andark, and it was uh, it was amazing. I loved it. It was really tough. It was it was really tough, and it, it's not the underwater stuff that's tough. That's fun, and especially it depends who you have as your instructors, doesn't it? Yeah. So the instructors I had were just the best, and they made it a complete pleasure. Um, and it, it was comical at sometimes. It, it was just, they were just brilliant to work with. Um, but the the stuff you have to learn, um, you know, you're going back to physics and yeah. math. I mean, I, you might, your brain might work quickly when you're 17, 18, 19, 20. But once you start getting to 50, your just brain just doesn't calculate <laughs> that stuff as quick as the youngsters on the course. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot to get through. There's a huge amount to get through in the exams. So I think if I'd known about the exams before I had a book to do the course, I might have been too scared to do the course. There's quite, quite, quite a lot of medical. There's, there's quite a lot of medical work on that as well, isn't there? Yes, you you have to have a really strict medical. I mean, it is really, really strict, but I'm used to those because of powerboat racing. We have oh. to have strict medicals in there. But yeah, you have to be very, um, very fit, regardless of your age. You know, if you're not, yeah. then they won't pass you. It's it's that simple. Mm -hmm. And rightly so, rightly so. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and we say that about diving, you know, being fit to dive is really important, even if it is in a recreational environment, because, you know, you're in another environment as it is, and relying on your fitness to you yeah. know get you out of any situation should they happen yeah and i don't think people take that into consideration um about fitness in diving and i'm sure at the dive show this year um didn't they have someone from dan speaking at the show about yeah. diver fitness and i think that is really important and i was speaking at the dive show at the same time that they were speaking because oh. i saw it and i thought oh i'll go to that and then i thought oh i can't i'm on stage <laughs> But I would have gone to that. So I think it's really important for people to know that they need to keep um, they need to keep uh, healthy. You know, don't drink the night before. Be careful what you eat. Anything that ra raises your blood pressure a little bit, just be very aware not to have that. If you're going to have something to eat, let's say if you're, um, you know, in a country where they do hot and spicy foods, don't have those the night before if you don't know how your tummy is going to react. So there's all sorts of things you need to take into mm. account from what you eat um, to how you are emotionally and physically yeah. so there's a lot of things to take into account just to keep you safe yeah. and by keeping you as in yourself safe you're also keeping the rest of the people within that team safe all the other divers because if something happens to you you might be taking away one of the instructors away from everyone else and, mm. and then 
you know, if you don't look after yourself, you'll cause problems for other people. So yeah. it's not just about looking after yourself. You've got to be on the ball for everyone else. It's about yeah. being respectful within the dive community. It's true. And you do forget that. I, th I think that gets forgotten sometimes. And it was good that Dan shared that at the Go Dive Show because you do see a lot of Instagrammers mixing, diving and drinking. And the two things don't go together. You know, no, they, don't. they have their place. And um, yes, yeah, it's, it's interesting that Dan would share share that, and, and it's good that they did. Yeah, yeah I think it was very good. I think the Go Diving Show had some great speakers on yeah. with some really interesting topics and to topics that are really, really important. Yeah, yeah. So, was that your first Go Diving Show? No, I went. Um, I went last <laughs> year as well, uh, and I loved it. It was absolutely brilliant. Um, there's show. just so much to do. I, I reckon they could push it a day longer, and it's still That's be packed. Exactly what we said. We needed yeah. three days. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it's so exciting seeing, you know, every type of person, you know, all ages come to the dive show and, you know, all the people from overseas as well. It's, yeah, it's a really important thing that happens every year. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there were so many people there of all ages. There was just everyone there. It was just a total mix. It was like a big family. It was just, uh, yeah, it was wonderful. It's just such a lovely community. Yeah, that's good. So from um, the diving side, you mentioned about marine conservation. So has that come from your power boating experience about what the things that you've seen around the world or in more the diving? No, that has actually come from uh, the power boat racing. I was doing some filming at one of the events um, and I'm used to boats starting engines and everything and the sound bellows out and it's like, oh God, it's so loud. And then uh, one of the big boats with a diesel engine, um, you know, to, uh, switched his engines on as I was stood behind. Um, and then the amount of black smoke that bellowed out into the air. I mean, I, I'm used to that anyway. But then when I looked down into the water, uh, funnily enough, I did film um, I did film the water. And then I, at some point I, I deleted it because I, I did want to use that in my talk at the dive mm -hmm. show. Um, but then the amount of crap that came out and then was on the surface of the water and all of a sudden the water's this just a multicolor mess of oils and you know fuel derivatives um i just saw that and i thought you know what i need to start putting something back um because this is um it's a huge playing field isn't it we all enjoy the ocean it's wonderful but a lot of people um enjoy the ocean but they don't give anything back or, yeah. you know, they go out on boats for a Saturday afternoon and they throw the rubbish over. And it doesn't matter whether it's a cigarette boat or a can. Cigarette mm. boats, you know, they'll get eaten by a fish who thinks it's a bit of food. Eh? The fish doesn't want to eat that, but he doesn't know any better. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I, that was it. It stemmed from powerboat racing, seeing what was actually happening and the pollutants going into the water. And I just thought, you know what, I just, I've got to put something back because it just, it was awful. It was awful. Yeah. So, yeah. Um... Do they have something like a sustainability manager? So I work with quite a few big firms and um, in my day job, and quite a few of these firms are now getting on to employing and appointing sustainability managers to look at the business, to look at you know things that go on and how they can improve things in a green way. So it's good something like that, you know, could they appoint someone like that? to then look at how they can, because you've got this balance, haven't you, between big engines and yes. the noise and the fire and, all, and the great how they sound, and then trying to have be green as well. That's, that's a fine balance. Yeah, it's a very fine balance. And the, the problem is uh, power boats, when it comes to uh, technology, let's say engines or what have you, like electric cars have been going forever, Um and, and they have tried running boats on, uh, you know, electric boats for years. I mean, you know, donkey decades ago, the first one but, uh, was run, um, but the speed records that they were setting were obviously very slow because they're never going to be as good as fossil fuels. I mean, eventually they will. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, going back to that question, funnily enough, at the end of last, no, it wasn't end of last year. I think it might have been this year um, when I became a UIM uh, commissioner, which I was really pleased about, I then thought um, about emailing into the UIM after I'd looked through everything on their website to see if there was anything about um, a marine conservationist or someone that was very pro the ocean. 
that if there was anyone there that actually actually looked after this and you know what there wasn't mm. um and i said i'm i'm really surprised it's not on there but you've got to remember it's um it it, it's a it's a very difficult thing because we we don't have that and we are behind other motorsports but not because uh, we want to be but it's very difficult for us because we're on yeah. water it, it's it's everything's difficult on water even filming is difficult <laughs> on water and it takes us three times as long to do a shot on water than it does on land uh, so I did actually write to the UIM um I, I wrote to a friend in the UIM and said listen this is what I believe in this is what I think could be incorporated what do you think and he put me in with the uh right person and the lady was very interested so at the moment we are speaking about that uh and it, as i said to them it doesn't matter whether it's me or whether it's someone way more qualified than me but i think we should do it because i maybe am not qualified enough but i'm passionate enough and yeah. i know the correct balance between power boats and conservation because i'm probably one of the only ones in the uim that races boats and does marine conservation because they're mm -hmm. so contradictory yeah. so therefore maybe i am the right person um but yeah i am looking at that i have put that forward and i will be chasing that up again in the next few weeks because you are right um something does need to be just put in place yeah yeah and it's not just the fuel side of things and the pollution it's like the marine wildlife and mammals that obviously are going to be affected by noise and disturbance within their environment yeah, yeah. do you know you, do you know what you're dead right and and recently, about a year ago, I started getting involved with OCRDA, which is um, circuit racing, whereas I do offshore, we go far out to sea. Um, but OCRDA are more into shore. And of course, when you come into shore, then you have the other problems with the sea life that live close to the shore, you know, and of course, dolphins. Um, and then when we promote our race on Facebook, you'll obviously get some people saying, oh, that's very well that you're coming down. But what about the dolphins? What if you hit a dolphin? And they are right. They do mm -hmm. have their concerns. Now, certain marine species are very wise, they're very clever, they hear the noises, they move away, but it's not always the case. I mean, fortunately, we've never had um, anything being hit that we know of. If anything is seen on a race course here or abroad, races are actually stopped. Um, okay. So it is mandatory. It's part of a rule. If there's anything, a manatee or whatever in the States, a powerboat race is stopped the area will be cleared and the race will start again. Yeah. So we do have people there spotting for a sea life. That's good. Um, but recently we are speaking to a company down on the south coast in the UK to give us the depredation pingers um, that we can then hang on to all the turn marks, which then hopefully kind of worn away um, sea life, yeah. uh, the, the dolphins. But it's, you know, these don't always work. But it's better to have them than not to have them. Yeah. You've got to be seen to be doing something as well as wanting to do something. Mm. So at the moment, we are currently in talks with this company, um, with the depredation pingers, to actually start attaching these to all the marks, hopefully um, to get the NEC life away before we put on an event. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully that might bridge over to the diving world, because um, when you look at some of these dive boats, uh, especially in the Red Sea, the clag come out the back of them sometimes. And it's like, whoa, oh, look at all that. It's bad. <laughs> it is. It is. And you think, and well, all, you know, going to go diving are, in that. Yeah. And these are old, dirty engines. These are engines that have been the same engines that they've had in those boats for decades. Probably. You know, whereas, yeah. you know, I think ours are at least a little bit cleaner. Not yeah. better, nothing's clean if it's an engine. <laughs> um, but yeah, you're you're right on that for sure. So what's Spain like for diving? Um, I don't rate it, you know. Really? Yeah, I don't rate it. I think it's okay. Um, and don't get me wrong, I'd enjoy diving wherever I am because when I'm down there, um, I just like being down here thinking this is great. No one can disturb me. <laughs> it's so peaceful and it's quiet. Such, such no an extreme. Yeah, from power boating to that and all that noise, and then yeah, into just hearing your own bubbles. That's I, it. I, I know. I love it. I have heard that the med is not as great as the uh, Red Sea. It was not. You don't get such good viz. I don't think there's the quite the life either as the Red Sea in the med. No, you don't. The visibility, I don't think, is that good. Even on a a good day, it's not great. Yeah. There's, don't get me wrong. There's certain areas where it's okay, but. I mean, all diving is beautiful in its own way, isn't it? Because yeah. you've got the calmness of the ocean. Um, you're nice and 
you know, it, everything's nice and quiet down there. So everything's beautiful. So you never have a bad dive because that's where you want to be and that's your home. Um, and of course, there's so many beautiful places around the world. Um, and I dived in Belize and that was like, yeah. it really, wow. yeah, I mean, that was incredible. Um, but then again, I wasn't overly happy with the safety of the people we were diving, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, that, that, and that was my, you know, I had a bit of a, you know, a problem with that. Uh, but every, not everyone who is trained then sticks to the rules that they are governed by, do they? True. Yeah. And obviously having that experience diving all around the world, you get that insight into seeing all these different levels yeah. of or not levels of safety and yeah respect yeah yeah and I, I think that quite often because some people do it in places like that all day every day and the diving is so beautiful and there's so much to see down there and it's so clear and it's so exciting that they then lax a bit on the safety aspect and that really bothers me they become a bit slack now, if you've got experienced divers, then no, being slack isn't good, regardless of who the diver is. <clears throat> Excuse me. But if you have experienced divers, if there's a problem, the experienced diver knows what to do. Mm. But it's not about the experienced diver. It's about the inexperienced diver. And yeah. then that becomes an issue for me because I felt that when I was in Belize, the people we were with, I had to have eyes on the newcomers because I kind of knew that they didn't. Mm -hmm. And that was an issue because I want my time to be taken up with seeing what I'm here for. And I was there for marine conservation, but I also spent so much time um, checking out other people who were in that team, as well as my dive buddy, um, you know, and she had a problem and she, she ran out of air. She ran out of air on the only dive I did not do with her because That's I was funny. doing some photography. The single dive I did not do with her, she ran out of air. And she ran out of air at 26 metres. Wow. Um, uh, and yeah, we can all turn around and say she should have been checking her air. But even divers that have done quite a few dives, if they've rushed into it, and let's say done uh, lots of qualifications all at once like me, they haven't got the experience to keep checking. Does that make sense? Yeah. They haven't done it over. And you know this whole repetitive actions again. Um, and yeah, you know, I was horrified when I found out because I know that when I was diving with her, I, I kept checking her air just every now and again. I was just checking it. Um, and she had the sense to swim over to um the the, the dive guide uh, and grab the octopus, and then she was fine, and they made the way up. Um, mm. but it's not okay. Nice. It's twenty six meters. It is yeah. not okay because he should have been asking everyone, "How's your air?" Mm -hmm. So he obviously didn't ask because she would have then looked at it and she would have said, you know, I'm low. But yeah. Did she have know, a buddy they, then? Um, she, who she buddied well, up with? I don't know. The thing is, I didn't ask her, I think, because I was so appalled at what happened and I didn't ask her who she buddied with. Um, mm. But I wanted to buddy with her because I knew she was, um, she gets too distracted. Yeah. So I did want to buddy with her every single time we went down. And she also... Um, she's a real heavy breather. She doesn't half suck that air. So um, right. when you dive with her, it's going to be a little bit shorter. Oh, she loves sucking that air. Um, but yeah, so I'm not sure. But I, you know, I wasn't happy with that. And also, I think as well, it's island life mm. uh, where we were as well. I caught. Um, and I don't know if I can say this, so please feel to edit this out. But I caught a couple of the guides. Um, smoking things they shouldn't round the back of uh you know kind of round the back yeah, of the yes island. Did. <laughs> yeah no and yeah. You, you know i did i went to the people that were in charge and i asked them about this they said oh no no they didn't do that and i, I said well they did because i saw them and i could smell it yeah and i said i just don't really think it's cool to be doing that before you dive in it's just not it you know no. um and then afterwards because there were quite a few problems we had two guys that ended up with no nosebleeds one guy popped his eardrum oh it went this was um, this was en endless it wasn't one of the, this was endless yeah. during the two weeks i was there so what was you doing what was you doing out there i know you said you was doing some marine work, but what was you actually doing well i was there to uh collect data for um the uh, quite a lot of the things that were happening in the ocean at that time and of course the lionfish so we were seeing about lionfish yeah. uh, because of course they shouldn't really 
have them over there. Um, and of course the lionfish were killing everything else. And mm. then yeah. you need to then, you know, it's it's not nice. You know, when you when you're told you're there to also spear lionfish, the last thing you want to do is hurt anything, especially if you, you know, you're like me. But then when you realize the problems they cause and they shouldn't yeah. be there, then it is just one of those things. And then we also did a lot of um uh cleaning beaches of plastic. Uh, mm. So we do a dive, get on the boat, go to a beach and do a whole cleanup. And mm. I don't think people realise that when you clean a lot of plastic off the beach and then ask the question, when will this plastic be back? And you think, oh, it might be a week, two weeks or a month. They say, oh, no, same time tomorrow, all this plastic will be back. So but what are they it, doing with the plastic ones that picked it up? They have a special area on each little atoll. Uh, and then this plastic eventually. So you fill all the bags with rubbish. I mean, within an hour, uh, me and Erica must have collected about nine bin bags full of crap. Wow. Um, and there was about 20 of us on the island. So think how many how many bags yeah. that was. And then there's a special area that it's put on, um, it goes to, and then eventually a boat comes over and takes that and then it's got rid of in a, a safe manner. Yeah, it's shocking really, isn't it? Because, you know, it's good that you've seen issues like the plastic because it just enforces how important the marine conservation and the importance of the ocean is. Yeah, there is. A, I think there's a lot. I think it's only when you go abroad that you see these sort of things, mm -hmm. whether it's people not performing safely. And then you do feel that you have to say something because it's not about you. It's about other people coming in and people that um, are new to diving. So it's not about protecting yourself. It's protecting the new divers that are coming in, making sure they have a good experience and then when you also see all the plastics that turn up on these beautiful little islands islands the atolls it's about understanding that when when you clear that plastic then it'll be back the day after and it'll look like you've never even cleared it in the first place and that's just one little atoll well what about all the others yeah. so it's only that i think when you go abroad you realize how bad plastics actually are we can read all the books we can read all the stuff on um just hope you know, they're not the dumping it at sea sorry go on we just hope they're not dumping it at sea yeah i can't imagine so because i think the um the tourism board down there are really quite hot on everything from safety yeah. through to plastics and they have a really good um team down there in the belize area i was at placentia and they yeah. really do have a good um, tourist board down there because I spoke to them um, a few times uh, just about all sorts of different things yeah. and you can tell that these are people that really care yeah, about really. divers coming there and getting a really good experience uh, yeah. and it's nice to see a tourist board so passionate about people having a good time and about the conservation side as well they're yeah. really big on the conservation side yeah yeah and we've we've we're outreach partners for reef world and, you know, they do an awful lot working with dive centres and it, kind of an assessment of how, you know, green they are and how good they are with plastic and, you know, their standards. So it's good, you know, that's a good place to go if you want to, you know, find a good dive centre to go to because of that rating and that approval that they get from them. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's important. It's always good to look at um to look at ratings and get mm. the approval and make sure you're going to the the right places so you dive in it is not only incredible <laughs> as it is in some places but also it's incredibly safe because um safety is the most important thing about diving yeah yeah yeah, yeah absolutely it's, it's just paramount yeah and you know it, like you said buddy checks they should never ever be forgotten about you always always do them so yeah absolutely Please. I mean, always. I mean, Erica, I mean, I spent my life buddy checking Erica. I don't think she ever checked me. Um, that was underwater. <laughs> but yeah, but um, you, you, but you've always got to have your, your eyes on your buddy, you know, before you go in. And then when you're in, you know, it's it's eyes on. It's a full time job, isn't it? You know, even it if is. it's pleasure, it's still a full time job. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what's it like? Um you know, merging this with, uh, you've done a lot of film work, you, you know, you're in, you, you work with the, uh, with Pinewood Studios, with Dave Shaw. So uh, what's it like, you know, having that as a career? Um, well, most my, well, most of my stuff, um, I've, I've actually got to give Dave a ring um, to see if he's got anything coming up because I wouldn't mind kind of um, diving in, so to speak, and doing something <laughs> quite soon. But a lot of my work really has been with uh, Dave and he's been looking after me as I've been on top of the water driving. 
Um, and then obviously you're working with the people that are then chucked overboard, so to yeah. speak. Um, but no, it, it's great being in the in the stunt world. It's not something I would want to do all the time because it, it, you have to dedicate your life to that. Um, and you go from one film to another film to another film. Um, and my life doesn't cater for being able to be to work nonstop in that capacity because I'm a volunteer for so many other things. Um, yeah. And because I volunteer a lot of time for other things, it can't be taken up working, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, but no, it's a lot of fun working with these people and everyone's an expert and everyone knows everything about all sorts of stuff and it's a really great um it's a really great industry and it was only about a year ago i was working on it hasn't come out yet but the new cameron diaz film um and that was brilliant to work. i was working with um diver dave shows divers again on that um so that was really good to work on that film and it's uh yeah it's a nice industry so if people yeah. get their hse you know, mm. their commercial diving license, then they can go into that line of work as a media diver. But unless yeah. you get your HC license, you yeah. can't then cross over and do that. No matter how many dives you have done, you can't sense. you can't do it until you've done your, your HSE. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um Dave Shaw years ago introduced us to a previous guest. I don't know if you know, but Valentine Films. You heard of Valentine Films? Mike yes, Valentine. Yes, I have. Yes. yes. Dave Shaw put us in in touch with uh, them years ago. Yeah. yeah. Dave knows everyone. He's just, <laughs> he's amazing. He, he's brilliant. He knows everyone and everything. Yeah. Well, it's certainly an exciting industry to be in and the people you meet as well and being in an environment where you're working with, you know, safety divers as well. That's just like amazing. Yeah. It's just such a, it's an interesting job that safety divers do not only the safety as aspect but um building constructions underwater mm. so stunts can be performed safely uh, and what people don't see is possibly what's going on under the water you know underwater ramps so that when a boat a boat launches off or shoots over something it hasn't just lifted out of the water the divers have been under there um constructing a ramp um, and it, it's just, it's interesting. It, it's fascinating mm. to know what goes on. But I think pe when people watch um, a film and there's any water sequence, I don't think they realise what goes into that water sequence mm -hmm. because it's a lot more than you actually see on the surface. And there's so many people there to make sure everything goes perfectly and that yeah. everyone stays safe. Yeah. And also it shows... Um, I know you've got to get your HSC, but we always say with diving, there are so many paths you can follow, so many avenues you can explore as careers or hobbies. It's not just a case of recreational diving. You can, you know, look at, you can be like an underwater filmmaker or, you know, like yourself. Or certainly, you know, well, you've done... Yeah, you can do absolutely anything. Uh, when I did the Talk at the Go Diving show, um, I think I touched on the fact that there are so many different careers out there um, because you can even do the, the diving on powerboat races where if a powerboat racer has an accident, you jump in the water, you pull them out of a canopy if they can't get out themselves and you save their life. And it's something that people didn't even know existed. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got the divers who work with, I mean, the Ocean Conservation Trust down in Plymouth are amazing and you'll be planting all the sea grasses <laughs> and they're doing so much down there that you can work with the Ocean Conservation Trust and, and you, you know, you're helping generate um, life in the water because uh, you need the sea grasses don't you you need all of these things but there's yeah. so much you can do if you're a diver i mean uh, there's it's almost like there's an equal amount of jobs you can do as a diver as you can um yeah. on land there's just everything but people don't realize that no mm, yeah and again it's it's trying to inspire people to look at snorkeling swimming because you never know where that leads then to get them to take their breath underwater and breathe underwater but you know equally important swimming and snorkeling you're still there and you've got that connection to the underwater world yeah yeah and I think you start with the with the snorkeling and then that's when people think well you know you know if a big wave washes over me I have a bit of a cough and a splutter I'd sooner <laughs> go down there and be able to breathe and not worry about that and well I want to go a bit further down 
and you know quite often with people that's where it all all starts and i just think being underwater is the most it's the most beautiful place in the world mm. it, it's like no other it's it really is it, it's incredible mm. yeah definitely people should have a look <laughs> read it it's just it's gorgeous under there and no matter where you go to everything has got something different to give um you know whether you want to concentrate on um i don't know um turtles or whether you want sharks or sardines or dolphins or or you just like sea grasses and corals and you only want to do shallow diving it's it doesn't matter what you want to do there's something for everyone for every taste uh you know and all the different dive sites around the world kind of cater for for one or the other and some cater for everything mm -hmm. uh, and it's just finding um your where you're most at home where your passion lies and what you want to do and what you want to see and yeah. it won't take you long before you're under the water and you know um what interests you the most you know and what you love seeing um and we all take our different routes but either way we all want the same thing you know which is the health of the ocean and yeah. we all want to enjoy spending time and meeting other people who are the same as us yeah. exactly yeah so have you got any dive sites on your bucket list that you haven't done yet uh i want to go out to south africa uh i want to do the sardine run i want to i don't i just want to go somewhere um somewhere i haven't been before mm. i mean i'd like to go out to the maldives yeah. um but i think there's so many places it's hard to say i want to go specifically here or there because i think no matter where i went i would find something that i would really love yeah. um so it, it is quite hard but one thing that i do want to do and my husband just never understands why i have this big thing about it it's just like i'd like to go to alaska and i'd like to live in the outback and i love snow <laughs> and ice but i'd love to go to antarctica yeah i really would um and of course i get people saying oh god why would you do that it'll be freezing yeah but it's so different there's a totally different species out there than there is over here um and and something like that is really interesting to me so yes i would love i suppose that is a big thing i'd really like to go out to antarctica and that's even if i'm working out there um i'd like to work out there or go out for pleasure diving out there it's um so yeah that is some to go somewhere freezing cold where it's all icy um yeah. i'd really like to do i really yeah. would what about wrecks do they interest you diving a wreck um i've done a few wreck dives um but maybe i haven't done enough i'm not overly in love yeah. with them and i think they are interesting um, of course, anything's interesting, isn't it, when it's underwater, yeah. because everything's just great. Um, so, yeah, wreck diving's okay. It's not one of my uh, big loves, but if there's a wreck there, I will dive it. But I won't yeah. specifically go and think, right, I want to go there because there's a great wreck. Right, um, okay. That wouldn't be something. But if somewhere, if there was somewhere that had the most beautiful corals, then yeah. I would go there. Or there was lots of sharks, I would go there. You like the wildlife. Yes, yeah. for sure, yeah. for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's good. Yeah, and I think that kind of makes sense because you're sharing, you're getting an insight into their natural environment as well, aren't you? Yeah, and I think that's really important. Mm. You know, it's how all the, the species interact with each other and interact with humans, you know, because yeah. they don't know who we are or what we are. We just look a bit odd to them. <laughs> you know, and I do, I think it's, I just think that is, that's very interesting. It's more interesting for me. Yeah. Um, to to do that sort of thing um but i do like things like um all the you know flora and fauna underneath the water and the and the sea grasses to see what's inside there swimming yeah. around that's just small you know it's yeah it's fascinating yeah yeah no it's really yeah really really good so we'll get on to our questions then we always ask any of our guests we have a few set questions so one of the questions we ask is is there any sort of nugget of from life that you want to impart on our audience is there anything that's kind of quite important to you as a nugget yeah i would absolutely say if you want to do something go ahead and do it and don't let anyone stop you unless it's something really stupid and dangerous and then fair enough um but otherwise if there's something that you really want to do um then go ahead and do it and don't do something because you're gonna maybe upset someone or make someone jealous or just go and do it because I lost a huge opportunity earlier on in life and now if someone says to me I don't want you doing that or you can't do that 
then there's no way I listen to him. I'm going to do that because of an opportunity yeah. that I that I am. I will never forgive myself for being upset that I'd that I would have hurt my boyfriend's feelings, you know. And I wish now what I knew. Uh, I wish I knew then what I know now. Mm. Um, so yeah, a hundred percent. If you guys want to do something, go ahead and do it and enjoy yourself and don't let anyone stop you. Very good. Very good. And then what challenge you? What what really gets you out of your comfort zone? Um underwater or doesn't have to be, but it can be. But generally, what what really what really sort of rattles the cage and maybe makes you think, mm, I'm not sure about this. What what oh, sort of challenges really, you? Oh God, it's a really difficult one because you've got to remember that I've worked in stunts and I also raised power powerboats. So <laughs> Um, try not to. Are you like scared kind of, of the dark? <laughs> no, I kind of. It's really hard. I kind of. I'll know when something affects me when it's in front of me, but um, I like don't what? really. Spiders. Do <laughs> you know what? I don't mind spiders. I don't like really little spiders. I, those do bother me a little bit because I don't know where they're going. I, I, I'm quite okay with big spiders, but little ones I don't like. But no, I'm quite nothing really bothers me that much i think i've kind of done so much and seen so much and been through so much um that no i'm i'm kind of all right listen when, when the time comes i'm sure i'll know <laughs> i'll run a mile fight or flight <laughs> what about underwater have you tried any like overhead environments like caves cave diving ah so that's interesting so you know when i've just you asked me the other question before and i said don't let don't let anyone ever tell you you can't do that <laughs> my husband and my mum have both said cave diving you are not doing that <laughs> <laughs> um so they have both said that i've been threatened absolutely no way am i able to do cave diving um and I, I, there's um and i do kind of get where they're coming from and i think i've watched too much too many documentaries on this um and i do get that I do get yeah. where, the, where they're coming from, and I don't know if I would want to do it. Right, so you've got me now potholing. Not <laughs> in a million years would you ever get me down a pothole. If you said to me, right, if you go 100 metres down that pothole and there's a massive bag of gold coins worth 20 million and it's all yours. Oh, you are you sure? 20 not, million? 20, no chance. Not, <laughs> no. So I'm okay. not going into small, tight spaces. <laughs> oh, um, you found it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you found it. No way. Small, tight spaces. Not not a chance. Um, <laughs> and, and cave diving. Um, you're like in the scuba diving bag or what have you, and I've seen that. And people have spoken at the Go Diving show about cave, cave diving. No, you're on your own there. Enjoy it. I'll just stick to the night so yeah. and see. <laughs> but I get why they're excited, and I get why they're so thrilled. And I get that because I can watch it and I can feel sick when I'm watching it. And I'm thinking, well, I wouldn't want to do that because I'd be throwing up in my reg, wouldn't I? You know, but it's... Uh, yeah, don't be doing that. Yeah, I, I, I just... Um, so, yeah, fair play to them. Cave diving, no, keep that to yourself. Okay, no. cave diving. But it looks amazing. Yes, and it's exploration, isn't it? But, yeah, there's a, I think you've got to have a certain mindset to um, get in a dark hole. Yeah, totally, <laughs> totally, <laughs> totally. <laughs> Okay, and the next question is, we ask if you could take three people underwater. They don't have to be divers, they can be people of the past, um, but just to show them the environment of an underwater world, who would you take and why? Um, I'm going to be really boring for my first one. I'm going to say my husband, only because... Um, when we go away and I go diving, he just goes to the bar, doesn't want anything to do with it, not interested. It's not that he's not interested in the ocean. He loves all that. He's a former Royal Marine as well, so he's done a lot of stuff on water. It's just not it's just not his bag. Mm. But I'd, I'd like to be able to then go on um, uh, a really nice dive trip with him and do it. Uh, I can also force him to pay for the holiday, of course. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, so I, I would. Um, you know, if Leah do that, then that'd be great. Um, yeah. But I don't think there's any chance of that. Um, so yeah, so that's one. So my second one um, would be Elon Musk. Now I don't know loads about Good him, choice. but I, yeah, but I know he has got the ability. Um, so I'm not asking him to put money in. That's his money. 
Um, he doesn't owe us anything. He's earned it. It's all his. He can do whatever he wants with it. But he does have the ability, um, because of the social networking and the platforms he's got, got to be able to put out to everyone um, some snippet of good information about marine conservation. He can get that to a really wide audience because of who he mm. is, and it won't cost yeah. him a penny. So he has got the ability to make changes and to help people understand more. Absolutely. So I would definitely love to take him diving and get him really on board with seeing the underwater world. You're a fan? You're a fan of Elon? Um, I'd take him or leave him, really. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that he could do... Um, I think he could do us a great favour if he was to put loads of stuff on social yeah. media, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, and my third one um, is actually a powerboat racer himself, Richard Branson. Hey. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so uh, Richard raced powerboats. Uh, he's done records. He's a great man, Richard. Um, but also... Uh, Richard would be useful, again, not because of the money side of things. Of course, keep your money. It's your money. Keep your money. But what he could do um, with the videos in the aeroplanes, because there's a little video on the back of everyone's seat, a little TV, every single flight, everywhere in the world, there could be a little ocean conservation video. And yeah. there could be a snippet about the dangers of plastics in the ocean or whatever anyone supports um, and that could be a little information segment that went out all the time. And just think how many millions of people you would hit every time they got on a flight. It would just be amazing. I think I might write into head office and even suggest it, to be honest. You, you should. You should. You should. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Well, he's a powerboat racer, so I'm sure he won't ignore me. But yeah, it, it, I think it, it should. Um, I think he could really make some changes with just a short video. Um, and it's really interesting as well. It'd be interesting and colourful. And I think that's next on my list to actually write in and suggest it. Yeah, it's and it's captive audience, isn't it? They can't go anywhere. This is, no. yeah, this is just the easy. It's a captive audience. <laughs> yeah. He's my old boss, funny enough. And, really? Uh, yes. Really? Yeah, I used to work Brilliant. for him uh, many moons ago. And I uh, did meet him a few times. So, uh, yeah, yeah, nice guy. Super, super nice guy. Always remembered our names. Yes. Always remembered our names. Yes. I, I was, I thought, you know, I've only met you a couple of times and you always remember our names. Mm. Never, well, never some, got it wrong. Some people are like that as well. And I think when people remember names, it really, it, it really makes you feel differently. It's uh, it, it, I think it's really special when people remember names. Yeah, it blew us away. That's like, yeah. how, how do you remember that? Of all the yeah. people who we meet, you know, and, but yeah. Um, yeah, that was, that was very nice. Very nice to, to uh, work for him. Yeah. Um, Right, last question. We, you know, these power boats are pretty big, aren't they? They get big. Funny enough, I saw one uh, last week, the Black Ball Racing, big orange one. I, yeah, we've got them at games coming over in Behind a great big lorry. And I looked at yeah. it and I thought, wow, that's awesome. And they are a really great big boat. So we, we well, normally funny, sometimes. I was drinking with the owner of that in the really? two no weeks way. ago. Yeah. <laughs> So well, yeah, well, so yeah, I know the lads. Yeah. Tell him I said hello, and I said and I saw his silver lorry <laughs> with the orange boat, and I very smart. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, I, I was with him the other week having a booze up in Benadol. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we're going to put instead of giving you a billboard, we're going to give you some advertising space on his boat. All right, and I'll tell him you, you said that. Yeah, please do, and say right. You're going to put a message out to the world. It can be a video. It can be an advert. It can be a statement, a picture, a video, whatever you want. That's your space. And that's going to put a message out to the whole world. When he's going around doing his laps, what are you going to put on it and why? Um, well, I put something very controversial on it um, because not everybody uh, likes seeing. I especially don't like seeing it. I, I, I get really upset when I see it. Um, but I would put images, uh, I don't even like saying it, um, images of animals, sea life in distress um, through um, damage. Um, you're like, there's there's that image of that shark that has that 
like a, a rubber ring around it, like a tire, you know, and it's trapped, mm. it's thin and it's cut into it. Yeah. Um, and things like that, as much as I hate looking at it and I get really upset, often emotional when I see things like this, because there's nothing we can do about it. Um, it would be a really disturbing image to make people sit up and be aware, because I think disturbing Im images um draw people in more than nice sweet images people nice image people go oh look at that how nice yeah and disturbing images make people feel a little bit sick and it hits home and you remember it so um i put a disturbing image on his boat uh, you know and a slogan about not to just use our ocean as a tipping ground it is yes mm, yeah it's education yeah and it, it's awful nobody likes images like that as i said and the and it's hard sometimes you, you get them coming up on social media all the time and you you want to skip over them because you can't bear seeing them but just because you can't bear seeing them and you want to hide your face doesn't mean to say it's not happening it's happening mm -hmm. and it's yeah. very real and we all need to do something about it yeah no it's a good answer yeah and, and they do that with cigarettes don't they mm. yes indeed they do they do yeah so it shows it's powerful and you know it, it, you can have all the nicey pictures all the time that that's not the real world is it no it's not the real world um but yeah that is uh, those are awful images but they make people sit up and they make people listen and that's all we want is people to sit up and listen and you know protect our oceans and everything yeah. that's in us mm, yeah no that, excellent so if people want to know a bit more about you um find out a bit more about the work that you do do you have the best place for them to go to find you have you got a website or social media um yeah my website is just sarahdonahue.com and then my instagram is at sarahdonahueofficial uh and usually everything kind of goes up on there um my facebook page again i have my regular facebook page which everything goes up on and my other facebook page which people end up going to i don't really put stuff on there it does kind of trickle down from instagram um, but yeah, I think mainly my website has most stuff on. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, we'll put, put that in the show notes and, uh, people can have a click on there and, uh, yeah, look you up, but yeah, it sounds like you've had an amazing variety of life and events. <laughs> yeah. It's been, it's been interesting. Most of it, I should say my mum isn't happy with, especially my crash and being on a life support machine and going back yeah. to racing and then. Every time I go diving, my mum goes mad. I'm a mum, I'm only diving. Yeah, but you, you, it's not normal <laughs> to breathe underwater. So, yeah, apart from the resistance of my parents, it's been great. But you've always got to get back on your horse. Always, always have to. Always. Yeah, yeah, and look forward, not back, because, you yeah, know, that's what you got to do. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It's important. It's always important to keep on pushing forward. Never live in the past. Always live for the future. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, that's a good note to end on. And uh, yeah, thank you for being on the Big Scuba podcast. It's been great chatting. It's been, oh, it's been fabulous. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. That's brilliant. <laughs> Welcome back. And uh, thanks for uh, uh, sticking with the podcast and listening. And I hope you enjoyed that. Yeah, Sarah yeah. was uh, yeah really interesting, full of variety again. Yeah. And um, I don't think we caught her talk at the go dive show we did we? no we saw her uh, walking about but no i think we probably missed her chat so. yeah we do need another day at go diving show we'll yeah she's to right go to mark can you not put a third day on but will there ever be enough days i don't know maybe not <laughs> yeah so that was really interesting um hearing her views on obviously ocean conservation and yeah the safety side and it, it, I I didn't say it, but I was kind of thinking while we were talking that, um, you know, I, I don't really know much about power boat, big boat, big engine, make lots of noise and go really fast. Great. Formula One had the same sort of thing, aren't they? Where they're, you know, they've gone from uh, V12, V10, back to V12, then down to V8, and then on to, I think, V6 engines now. Because, you know, and I guess maybe that would be the way that they might go. I don't know. Um, yeah, but she's you know at the end of the day, it's all revolving around money. Money will always be the the mm. uh, the biggest denominator in sport, uh, especially things like that, because it's a bit like diving, isn't it? you know, you it takes a bit of money to get started. You need the kit, you know, then you've got to go diving, 
you got to put fuel in and things like that, and it all adds up, doesn't it? After a while, mm. and um, yeah, it's, it's quite it's interesting. And she, you know, she obviously really loves being in the water and on the mm. water, part of her life. Yeah, yeah, and again, you know, it goes kind of hand in hand, and it's good that you know she did make the point. You know, these massive boat power boats, they are noisy. They're fumes, fuel, but. You know, she's seeing the other side of it as well and doing and giving a bit back, which was yeah. one of the things. But, but it's these uh, sports like Formula One, such as power boats, so it's the high end of it, is that they've got the money, they've mm. they come up with the technology. Those things then filter down to, you know, life. You know, so that technology you will see in the next car. We might see that technology in the next dive boat. Mm, yeah. Where they're running on, you know, uh, green oils, and you know. Uh, what, oils. <laughs> what, what are they run up? You know, you can put like uh, cook an oil. Yeah. Cook an oil and all that in, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But it's, you know, interesting to see how it will evolve and, you know, the electric power boats as well. Yeah. I I just, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't mind electric cars and electric um, boats and what have you, but it's hard to not think, well, I don't know, maybe a bit of noise be nice. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And it is a sport at the end of the day as well. Yeah. I, I think once, companies kind of um uh, can somehow make a electric car or electric boat sound awesome and you think wow listen to that you know because you do like the drama don't we we do like the sound people like following form the one because they want hear the noise and feel the atmosphere you know and i think you'd get more people then think well what that's green that that's electric in there how's that possible yeah, it's converting the audience as well, isn't it? And the fans. We, and we are at the very start of all this. You know, the technology combustion engine hasn't been around all that long when you look back at the man's history. Mm. And, um, you know, we're now at the start of the electric phase. So, you know, the technology's got a long way to go. Yeah, no, it's true. So, but yeah, that was. Big thank you to Sarah for coming on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. I hope, uh, you know, um, some things that she said, people will take on board and think, hey, good idea. Yeah. And again, it's that connection with the ocean, maybe a powerboat um, racer, but, you know, she's been ventured in the underwater world and marine stunt woman and, you know, done her HSC. So, yeah. We'll yeah. Her. Very sensible. It's very good to hear um you know she's very hot on health and safety mm. um because obviously you know that is important it's a good thing about what the uk stand for we do stand quite high on our health and safety and what have you in all parts of it um and um yeah i, I thought that was quite i thought it's quite good as well that she picked up on that it's not good not so good to go from one course to one course to the other course and then yes. yeah. without doing much diving in between yeah, yeah, she recognises, yeah, the, the um, see practising skills and getting that repetition and muscle memory in. I can't imagine doing open water to advance and then to rescue all in two and a half weeks. Uh, that's probably why I should raise my hand and say, uh, I did do that. What, in two and a half weeks? I did. Um, I went from open water straight on to advanced. Uh, was my next and quite a few people do do that but, but in what time scale within the month wow um and then uh i did some other courses and i thought yeah i was pleasure diving as well at the same time but it was all boom 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 mm. boom really quite within six weeks I, i'd say um but i did take a while before i then did do the rescue course which mm. Rescue course, I think, is a brilliant course. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. And I'm glad I waited to do mine as well. Yeah, yeah. You, you do you get an awful lot of reward from it, I think, and that's probably the best course. Yeah, I've done. Yeah, I think so. I, I, although I quite like the advanced as well. 
I think the advance is quite good because, you, you know, you, you've moving away from, oh, you've got to learn how to do this, you've got to learn how to clean mm. your mask, all, all those things to actually learn more about the dive inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but they're all things that need to be kind of, you know, again, it all comes back to repeating the skills and, you know, practicing skills. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you're listening, uh, let us know what you think. Give us some mm. Give us some feedback. Tell us what, what about the what Sarah said. If you know any, do you disagree? Maybe you disagree. Maybe you agree. Who knows? Yeah, we like hearing people's opinions, and they're in the Everyone's show. Everyone's got one. Yeah, you can email us. You can call the back phone. You can send us a message on our social media platforms as well. There's plenty of places to get hold of us. <laughs> yes, so do yeah. that. And if you want to uh, go back and you can listen to well over 170 episodes in the back catalogue of all varying guests, then yeah. just look up Big Scuba and you can download on all the major podcast platforms. I do believe Sarah was our first uh, diver who also powerboat yes, as well. definitely. Yeah, and we have spoken to people connected to the filmmaking, underwater filmmaking, Mike Valentine. So yeah. that's that's definitely there's two episodes with Mike. Definitely a fun one. He throws a teddy bear. <laughs> he does. He talks about a few James Bond characters as well. <laughs> Mike Valentine bowled us over, didn't he? Because we we spoke to one guest and um, we listened very contently to uh, for let's say nearly two hours, and then the next guest was Mike Valentine, who kind of. <laughs> Kind of blew us away a little bit, didn't it? We sat there because we, we actually grinning, did that one together, didn't we? <laughs> Just grinning from literally ear to ear from the time Mike came on to the time Mike said goodbye. We yep. didn't stop laughing, grinning, uh, smiling. And just had a whale of time. Exactly. Like so I think you listen to Sarah. So that that we advise go back to listen to Mike Valentine. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And we need to say thank you to our podcast sponsors, Narked at 90. We certainly do. So they'll be on technical. So look them up at narked90.com and they can cover all your technical diving needs your rebreather needs and they're there for the recreational diver as well and they're very much into dive computers particularly ratio computers they're the uk stockists and service center for ratio computers yeah really whizzy uh dive computers if you are especially if you if you like your depth and you're into your tech diving at the minute they they have got some really whizzy, uh, look them up, ratio computers, look up um, the IX3M2. There's three, there's the deep, there's the pro, and there's the tech plus, what I've done an unboxing on. Uh, look it up and uh, even got 20 waypoints, GPS waypoints that you can put in. Mm. Uh, there is a non-GPS version, but there's a GPS version if you want the whole bells and whistles. Yeah. And uh, I think you're going to, if you look at that and you love your tech dive and you like your kit, it's going to be a hard one to say, mm, mm, maybe I don't want that. Yeah, they're lovely, great display, quite simple to use with the sort of buttons and yeah. Yeah, great build quality as well. So yeah, yeah. look them up at NARC 90 and go to Ratio Computers. Yeah, I will add apology. If anyone did hear my stomach, stomach rumbling, I'm not eating all day. <laughs> no, it not. wasn't thunder. <laughs> Right then, you better go and have something to eat. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so on that note, I think that was the Big Scuba Podcast. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Now that does wrap up today's episode of the Big Scuba Podcast. But if you want to hear more from the podcast, make sure you hit that subscribe or follow button, depending on what platform you are listening on. That way, you will never miss an episode from us. But if you are listening on Apple Podcasts and did enjoy what you heard today, we would really appreciate it if you head to the show page to leave a five-star rating and review. It really does help us. If you do, please take a screenshot of that review and send it to us on Instagram and we'll give you a shout out to say a big thank you. If you have any questions for us, or anything that has been mentioned in today's episode, be sure to reach out to us on any of our social media platforms or send us an email. The links are in the show notes. We will get back to you no matter what. 
If you have made it to this point in the episode, we both want to say a big, big thank you for tuning in and we'll see you on the next episode. Thank you.